I want to thank our media partner today, that's Atlanta Homes and Lifestyles. And then I also want to thank our showroom partner today, that's Peacock Alley. Remember that we're going to go after this panel presentation to Peacock Alley, that's at ADAC West, uh, Suite A6. And we have team members that are here on site to help guide you over there, so don't worry. Um, and all three of our designers on stage here have designed a bed at Peacock Alley. So we want to make sure that you get a chance to see um, their perspective on a Peacock Alley bed. So um, come over and, and join us and check that out. And with that, I'm going to turn things over to Lauren Iverson, who is the Editor-in-Chief of Atlanta Homes and Lifestyles. All right. Thank you, Katie. Can everyone hear me? Am I on? All right, we're good. Um, all right, thank you, Katie, and thank you... ADAC for having us here today. Uh, I see a lot of familiar faces out in the audience. So we're really excited that you can all join us this afternoon for this talk. Uh, I'm so thrilled to be on stage with these three powerhouse designers who I've been able to become acquainted with over <laughs> recent years. And not only do I know and love them, but I know that the rest of the Atlanta design community also knows and loves them, as well as everyone who's sitting here in this room. So first we have Carol Weeks. Uh, Carol brings over 25 ex years of experience to her clients and her interiors have been featured numerous times in publications, including our own. She's been in show houses. She's received countless awards for her work. Um, with projects around the country, Carol continues to consider her clients' individual tastes first and incorporates these into a design that is uniquely theirs. Next, we have Lauren Deloach, an Atlanta native. Lauren embraces timeless Southern design with a fresh approach. With 20 years on residential projects, she finds inspiration in architecture, art, antiques, and these are her key elements to bringing a sense of history to all of her designs. So Lauren is also regularly published in regional and national design titles, and she has appeared in several of Atlanta show houses. And last but certainly not least, we have Devin Taylor. Devin established her design firm with a passion and appreciation for elegance and the idea that luxury and simplicity can coexist. Her spaces are meticulously executed and created for harmonious living. So Devin, of course, along with these other ladies, has been featured many times and participated in our Home for the Holiday show house as well. So welcome, ladies. I'm so excited to have all of you here today and to celebrate this big milestone with us. So for those of you who don't know, Atlanta Homes and Lifestyles is turning 40 this year. It's our birthday. Um, happy birthday. Thank you. I promise I won't make you sing happy birthday to us. <laughs> um, so uh, our conversation today is really kind of leaning into this theme of evolution and taking a deeper look into how the luxury design scene has changed over the decades here in Atlanta. So with that, I would love to start by taking a little walk down memory lane. Um, can you guys start telling us a little bit about some of the design trends over the years? I was in our office the other day looking through some archives, and it was so interesting and fascinating to me to see, you know, not only design trends from the 2000s, but then the early 90s and even a little bit into the 80s and beyond. Um, what are the key differences between some of these decades, and what, what are we seeing in those? Carol, do you want to start? You left out the 70s. <laughs> <laughs> and and, and a full dis disclaimer, I, I was not a designer in the 70s, nor most of the 80s, but the um, 70s were interesting because it was a, a period of time where people were becoming a little freer with how they expressed themselves and um, probably due a lot to recreational um, whatevers. <laughs> you saw a lot of things evolved such as sectionals. Sectionals became very uh, popular and now we're still seeing such, uh, sectionals. Mm -hmm. The uh, pit group uh, came to be and that was, do you know what that is? Do you even know? Three-sided sofa with a huge coffee table. Some really odd things were going on <laughs> and in, in many ways. But what I, what I noticed when I started thinking about it was that the way that went into the 80s, and the 80s were so different. You went from Mario Guada and the chintz and the festooned curtains and the ruffles and the bows, and then we went into English dark green painted libraries mm -hmm. uh, with gosh, rich colors of crimson and, and green, heavy, heavy things. And then from there, you just pop into shabby chic. 
which was the total opposite. And it's, it's funny if you notice, it seems like every trend reacts to what we have been doing. You know, yeah. it's just, so you go to Shabby Chic, which is not something I ever really embraced because people were doing it themselves and that was not profitable. <laughs> but, but, but think about Shabby Chic. That led us down a road to where we are now. And also think, chintz is coming back, sectionals are still popular. Uh, I'm, I'm noticing a lot of beautiful green rooms in lacquer paint. So it seems like even back then, the good parts of design stick to right. Maybe we do a U-turn, everything looks different in your rear view mirror. Mm -hmm. And some of it you don't want to revisit, but a lot of it you do. And I'm, I'm sort of curious to see what you have to say going forward. Mm. Well, I was thinking about the 80s from my own personal experience. And my mom had this thing. I think it was called Country Clutter. Did anybody else have that beautiful <laughs> Indeed, style? Yes. Okay. So really tiny little wallpapers with Williamsburg blue and mauve and um, all kinds of uh, cross-stitch samplers and that kind of thing. And I was thinking about how did we get from that to where we are now. And... Um, I, I just think it was something that felt homey to us, and I think we always gravitate towards things that feel like home. Mm -hmm. um, and she was from Kentucky, and I think that sort of like spoke to her. Um, and I loved it back then. I loved those balloon curtains and um, the ruffles and all that. Yeah. Um, but then I, after the shabby chic thing, I think we ended up going into more um, gray. You know, mm -hmm. we kind of that. I think we took that like washed out sort of palette, mm -hmm. and then we went really gray. And, um, and a little bit more, um, I don't know, not, not as many details, kind of like washed out. So that's kind of where I feel like we headed from that point. Um, and then I think as far as like homes, I think we went into like big open floor plans and stainless steel appliances and things like that that we were all cra uh, craving um, in, in, in the 90s and two, early 2000s. You want to take it from there? I will. Because <laughs> I have opinions. Oh, whatever there. So I would say for me, I think that the big thing is I'm from Los Angeles, and I lived there most of my life. So the idea of coming to Atlanta and the architecture, it was the idea of the McMansion in the early aughts, right? And so it was like the bigger the house, the more rooms that you have, the better. We created this thing like a office. Everybody thought that a mom wanted to pay her bills by the mud room and the back door. <laughs> I, it wasn't really a thing, but I hadn't seen that before until I moved to the South. So that's something very specific to Georgia and Atlanta for me. Um, so it's that idea that how many rooms can you have? You're maximizing that. And also, you know, when you're talking about the early aughts, it's also upholstered walls. It is, I remember a time where it was like more was more. And you were layering, you know, the wallpaper with the coordinating drape and all of that. And guess what? Just like fashion, it comes around again. Because some of my favorite designers now are doing that in show houses. And I'm like, oh, it's just so chic. Now, 20 years ago, when I was 20 years younger, it was like, mm, that's not really my style, right? But you have to think about I think that there's absolutely a direct correlation between fashion and then how that comes through in interiors every single time. Right now, my daughter is loving wide leg jeans and clips in her hair and a crop top. And it's just like, that's this 90s, right? And so that is also kind of a resurgence in I'm sure more of the things that we're gonna speak about. But for me, it's definitely that idea of floor plans and how that has totally shifted and then when we're talking about maximalism, for me, that is what I remember. But again, like you're saying, it was the shabby chic. It was as we come out of that, it's absolutely reflected in what we're wearing and our color palettes and, um, and interiors. And music. And music. That's music, it. all the pop, you know, that started in the 70s and the 80s. That was a big influence on, yeah, the, on I, the attitude. I guarantee people are in that conversation pit listening to Stevie Nicks. <laughs> like, there was a thing. <laughs> yes, sir. Absolutely. Uh, and you know, one thing I was thinking about, and it's how different the South and the Southeast, because I am a Southeastern designer, and so that was always my focus. I did work other places, with, but typically my clients were, at that time, Southerners. 
and how different we regarded design. Yeah. I'll bet you anything that 90% of the living rooms in Buckhead were painted yellow. <laughs> And the and yeah. yes, during that period, the 70s and and mostly the 70s, but some in the in the 80s, yellow, lots and lots of of the same sort of uh, porcelain displays and the English furniture with the secretary, and we held on to that for a long time, and I think it took some of the things that you were mentioning for people to sort of shake loose of that, mm -hmm. and I didn't really notice people giving it up until probably the late 80s or yeah. the early 90s when they realized shabby chic gave them permission mm. to, to, to do something else. And it was comfortable and it was friendly. And have you ever noticed once people get comfortable being comfortable, they usually don't go back <laughs> to something. <laughs> I'm pretty sure Victorian furniture is never coming back in style. <laughs> I love it. Well, it's so fun to kind of talk a little bit about some styles of the past and elements that we've seen evolve over the time. But one thing I think that most of us can probably agree on is never going to be turning back is technology. Mm -hmm. So over the years, technology, you know, it has improved exponentially and has made its way to the home through smart appliances and more durable fabrics and higher grade materials. So how has these technology advancements really transformed the way that we live today compared to 30, 40 years ago? Uh, Devin, do you want to start on this? Or? Sure. Um, for me and my clients, technology is something that I've made a point to weave into what we do. So when we're thinking about automation, what it's always kind of having to work backwards when you're a designer sometimes, right? If we know that our clients want everything in their home to be control for and their AV to coordinate and can work everything from your phone, and guess what? Well, you have to think about these things when you are specking this house. Where are your outlets going to be? What's your low volt look like? What does your electrical plan look like? Because we all know the whoops, didn't think about that is really expensive. You know, and so if you have the ability to think about how you're going to integrate that technology into your home on the front end, when you're thinking about sound, your exterior lighting, and all of that, you have the ability to use um, from your phone. And then also thinking about performance fabrics. That was probably one of the most important things for my clients mm -hmm. because a lot of them have children and or their musicians or athletes that have very specific lifestyles. <laughs> so um, with that, it's, you know, before you would have some color limitations. Well, now it's like, well, this now can come in a performance fabric. So you can power wash it if you want. You know, if you, there's not a big, whoa, don't flip the pillow over if somebody spills red wine when they're getting out of a sofa, right? It's like, it's okay. We can, we can actually just put this whole cushion in the washing machine. So I think that that is something for me and my clients when it comes to the automation in the home and integrating that with all that you can. And then performance fabrics for sure. Definitely. Mm -hmm. I think the that. performance mm -hmm. fabrics are funny though. I think it's almost a double-edged sword because I think it almost pushes people to live harder in their houses. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see how see what indestructible can do. we can make it. So I feel like sometimes it's, it's, it's a little bit of a... Oh, you mean when you give your client the swatch and you're yeah. like, look, you can put oh. red wine on it. And they're like, really? Yeah. <laughs> right. Yeah, so I feel like that's sometimes not, it's it's not as bulletproof as we, as we like to think it is. Sometimes it really isn't. <laughs> right. And the other thing I was thinking about is TVs. You know, yeah. back um, in the 80s and earlier, TVs were huge. And it was not in every room because you had to plan a whole room around it. And now we have this luxury of, you know, they're so slim and they can either be disguised or mm -hmm. we put them out and... And we don't think twice about it. It's actually, we've all kind of embraced. There's that big mm -hmm. black square in there. <laughs> sort of. The must have sort of square, embraced it. right? Yeah, yeah. Carol, what about you? What kinds of technology changes have you really noticed a shift in for over the decades? Everything that they said <laughs> times two. Yep. Uh, you know, it has made uh, some of my clients, um, you know, 20, 25 years ago were dot com, mm -hmm. and they were so on it. I mean, they, and I was just like, I couldn't even operate myself. I didn't even have a cell phone, maybe. <laughs> I don't know. But it, it, I really had to, to wake up. I agree with, I think that the performance fabrics have made the biggest difference mm -hmm. to, to most designers because you have an option. 
to let people choose a neutral palate without having it be trashed within six months. And if you've got dogs, children, whatever, it, it becomes an essential part of what you're doing. Um, and now some of the lines have really good performance fabrics. Absolutely. I, I mean, they feel great. Yeah, yeah really great. Mm -hmm. And you don't see one thing, uh, it was interesting what you said, the televisions no longer feel like they have to be encapsulated in an amois. <laughs> you know, now they're just brazenly up on the wall. Oh, yeah. And they yeah. look good. And they look, I mean, too. it's almost odd to yeah. see them in a compartment yes. now. So that's another good change. Absolutely. Here again, it goes back to what we were all talking about before. Things have become friendlier. Things have become more comfortable, more livable. Yeah. And I don't think that people are going to go back to certain things because it just doesn't work in this lifestyle. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Now we've talked a lot about different design trends throughout the years and depending on your tastes, you are either having feelings of nostalgia or you're wincing a little at some of these trends that you're hoping to stay in the past. Um, but what I'm curious to learn more about is things that haven't changed, you know, over the last 10, 20, 30, 40 years, what design trends or elements have really stood the test of time here in Atlanta? Um, Lauren, do you want to start? Well, I think here especially we embrace um, antiques. I think we all love a beautiful antique, whether it's passed down in your family or it's something that you've acquired yourself. Um, I incorporate them in pretty much in every room. I think it makes a lot of difference in the way that the room feels when you layer in like a sense of history with, with the furniture. I think it's super important. So I think that's something that has been embraced throughout the decades and is going to continue to be embraced. Absolutely. Yeah. Carol, what have you seen that's really stood the test of time here in Atlanta design? Maybe that's you still use in your projects these days that you were using Not years the pit ago. group. Not <laughs> the pit group. <laughs> um, although there are some people who really need a pit group. Um, I agree with Lauren. I think that, that um, and it's just, it's, it's just what I enjoy doing, mm -hmm. is putting something that is vintage or old mixed in with new things. I feel like it just gives, as Lauren said, that layer where everything doesn't look like it just came off of a showroom mm -hmm. floor. Mm -hmm. People seem to enjoy that, and now more than now more than ever, yeah. I think they want some versatile piece in there that doesn't just look store bought. Mm -hmm. And um, and as far as other other things that maybe have lasted. Here again, let's go back to the South. I mean, the South is always going to put a high priority on home and, and garden. And I'll, if you care, go and look in the house and garden archive. Look at some of the rooms that they published in the 90s. Mm -hmm. You will see some incredible work and work that is relevant today, work that could have been done today. So it just... You know, it just speaks to what we're talking about, mm -hmm. that, that the good design lives on and the fads, the frivolous, the whatever, they're made fun of. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. Mm -hmm. Devin, what about you? I know you, you grew up in Los Angeles, so you might have a <laughs> little bit of a different perspective. I do, uh -huh. and but I will say this. I had not gone to a garden party until I moved to the South. <laughs> I am a big fan of the garden party. Oh, yes. But I think that, so it's it's absolutely that, and I know that we have a lot more to talk about, but it's definitely in the South. We live outside. There are some, there's so many things when it comes to the culture of college football and, um, and gardening and some things that specifically only can grow here, right? So that is something that sticks out to me. The other thing is brick houses. Oh, yes. Y'all love a brick house. <laughs> <laughs> and how has that stood the test of time? When you're talking about materials and integrating them, you know, if you, um, we all have seen those red brick houses are all white, right? And so, but that's still trying to keep in mind, we always have to think of where we are. We are in the South and that does have some tradition to it. And you do want to, this is why some people choose to live here, mm -hmm. is because of the lifestyle and then because of that indoor-outdoor lifestyle and because of the architecture is so specific to here, 
right? I think that if you were to see some of the homes on Peachtree Battle, you know, in Miami, you'd be like, that's an interesting choice, right? So I think that that's something that we all should be proud of, that we, whether we're designers or we're DIYers or whatever, that there always is that thing that with all of the different neighborhoods that we have here in Atlanta, it's very specific to Atlanta, right? If you have a home that you've redone in Madison, Georgia, or Athens, or if you have a cottage or a bungalow in Peachtree Hills here, it's so specific. I think that if you are native to Atlanta, you could show someone a picture of a home and you'd be like, I know where that is. Because Absolutely. it's you guys have done such a great job, and this community has done such a great job of really being mindful about that sort of thing so that things feel like they have a place. Definitely, mm -hmm. definitely. There's a lot of pride in, in homes here in the South that I've learned, especially since moving here. And it, it's fun for us on Instagram or in our pages of our magazine when you see these homes and they're beautiful and then you are driving down the road one day and you see it and you're like, oh my gosh, I've seen this house before. Here it is. Um, so that's always really fun. And when you guys do your designer takeovers for the designers yeah. that live in different neighborhoods and you can see like other designers where they chose to live and some of their favorite homes, it's always very specific to yeah. that neighborhood. So yeah. I think that's a good tradition. Definitely. Now kind of on the flip side of that last question is what kinds of design trends do you think have completely changed from 10, 20 plus years ago? Carol, do you want to start? Does anything come to mind? Um, somebody else go first. Let me think of anything. <laughs> I just think paint colors or even um, fabric choices. I, I or just feel people like everything up. is goes now. Mm -hmm. People get to do what they want to do. Yes. And that's the beauty of, of design now that we have evolved into, a, you know, just this Absolutely. free form sort of. And sometimes it's not good. I'm always distressed when I see someone take a 1940s Georgian house and try to turn it into a loft. I mean, you know, mm -hmm. it's just, <laughs> buy a loft, really. <laughs> it's gonna be a lot less expensive and, and easier on me. But, but I, I do think that, that... No, I think you're right. Yeah. And I think, like you said earlier, things are coming back around. I mean, mm -hmm. the good yeah. stuff remains sometimes, yeah. maybe not, but, um, but I think, you know, I don't love bright color, but I see a lot of bright color coming back in. And, oh, yeah. Um, that maybe is harkening back to a little bit of those every room a different color in the 80s kind of thing. Yeah. Um, that was a little much. <laughs> but you were saying a fun story earlier about your red dining room or red bedroom oh, the or first so. Time and that was I was ever published in, in your magazine. Someone called and said, we don't you have a red dining room? It was a red Osborne and Little wallpaper. I, I so remember it. Can we use it for our, our holiday issue? And they did, and I rented some friends to come in, and we formed a <laughs> cocktail party. <laughs> and, and that was a long time ago. That was a long time ago, but the red dining room went in tandem with the yellow living room. Absolutely. That was it. That oh, was yeah. It, it, oh, wow. it was a no-brainer. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Devin, what about you? What kinds of things, you know, have completely changed, would you say, that trends and different design elements throughout the decades? So I'm thinking about getting a, away from being so traditional and I don't want to say uptight, but maybe. Um, we are more into casual design. And you know what? I have opinions about this but the idea of getting rid of the dining room. I have so many people who are like, I just use it twice a year. And usually for my clients, it's always the most painful room to design because we always need 10 chairs and every single chair they want, they're like, it's what? And then we need it in a performance fabric. <laughs> and, you know, and so when you think about the rooms and how we live and what is important, and so for you to use all of the square footage of your home, the dining room is always like, let's borrow the square footage from there and let's incorporate it into the kitchen mm -hmm. so we don't have a breakfast nook anymore, right? It's more of like a family, it's more mm -hmm. of like an attached dining room. So I would say that's one thing for me that I feel like people are getting away from the formality of feeling like I have to have this room. But if it's designed well, then use it, that square footage mm -hmm. that you have in another way. Mm -hmm. Perhaps that's almost an outcome of 
of the COVID days, you know, where yeah. things have become more casual yep. and laid back that yes. there's less need. I'm know? wearing pants with a button today. You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> we love to see it. I love it. Amazing. Well, one thing I did want to make sure that I touched on is population growth here in Atlanta. So over the years and the decades, obviously, Atlanta has grown by millions of people. Um, most of them are coming from outside of the South, myself included. And so how has this different demographic changed the way that your design process is and or your style? Carol, do you want to start? Great thing to happen. A great thing. Mm -hmm because all of a sudden we weren't inside that little box doing the same old thing. It caused us all to grow, to study, to travel. And they came in from all over the place, from California and New York and Chicago and Texas, and they had their own ideas. Mm -hmm. they, they had been exposed to things that we had not necessarily, we'd seen it in magazine, but none of our clients were doing those things. Mm -hmm. So I think it was really probably one of the most exciting things that happened to Atlanta or the South. Uh, Atlanta especially, because we started thinking in different ways and experimenting with different things and with clients who were willing to let us do it. Mm -hmm. So that was a very, and plus they were, you know, People from California were used to spending a lot more money than people from Atlanta. <laughs> so if that, that all worked out just really well. Yeah. <laughs> oh, so funny. Lauren, what about you? How did it change your um, design process? Well, one of my most interesting clients has been um, this couple that primarily resided between Hong Kong and Australia. And they bought a place here, and he was Scottish and she was American. And they were so well-traveled and so interesting and had so many stories. And, and they loved also the nod to Southern architecture and Southern design, and they wanted to incorporate that. But I had to really kind of be real mindful and dial back what I was planning to do so that their you know, traveling artifacts and books and things like that could shine up against the backdrop of what I had done. Um, and I just think... It's fun to deal with people that have different experiences from you, and it really does. It pushes you to learn and to grow and to do something different. So. No, Devin, as a transplant yourself as well, yeah. how is your experience different maybe from, from an Atlanta native? Well, I think it goes back to the diversity and the types of homes. I mean, you literally can drive 45 minutes in any direction, and you can be in Serenby, which mm -hmm. is its own vibe in itself. You can be, you know, at Lake Oconee. You can, you know, you can be in the mountains, you know. So I think that if you are someone who is not familiar with all of the different um, vibes, really, that Atlanta has to offer, it is not just a city. I almost feel like sometimes our downtown is one of the last things I would show someone. You know, I think there are so many more interesting things in the city because I don't consider Atlanta just like Fulton County, right? Mm -hmm. I feel like Atlanta is so much more than that. It is, you know, everything that's going on in Summerhill right now. Absolutely. It is um, actually what should be a loft being a loft. <laughs> it is, um, you know, kind of, I've seen so many throwbacks to maybe a New York Harlem brownstone that people are really trying to, it's more not Southern, but it's an East Coast vibe, mm -hmm. right? Um, and then you can also implement, so, you know, if you have a lake house, it can be beachy, but it can also have a mountain vibe because that is our water source here is, there, it's lakes and mountains. So you can also riff off of that. So I think that the diversity of homes and the way you can live here is really appealing to other people because if you are in a Los Angeles, it's, do you live in the hills or do you live at the beach, you know, or just, are you in a city, which yeah. is very much city living. Um, so I would say that's, that's what I think about that. Yeah, it's definitely really interesting when you think about it that really anything does go, kind of going back to your point too, Carol, that you know you can have rustic chic with glamour thrown in there too. Um, at our Serenby mm -hmm. show house, they had an antler chandelier with jewels hanging from it, and it actually was beautiful. So, mm -hmm. so really anything goes these days, and to have these transplants coming in, um, it, it's a fascinating thing to see. Yeah. 
what ideas they throw at you. But while there are, we're on the topic of clients and our design processes, um, many times designers are having repeat clients. I'm sure many of you, or all of you have had many of those yourselves. Uh, they're designing multiple homes, you know, for families over a course of however many years. So in your own personal experience with, the, with this, what changes have you seen between these homes that you're designing for the same families over the decades. Lauren, do you want to start? Do you have any repeat clients? I don't really that have that many. I have one right now, but it's the same client, just a different location. So yeah. a lake house, you know, and they have a city house. So um, I think locale has a lot to do with the change Definitely. in the request. But I don't have generational repeat clients yet. Carol, what about you? Do you have any generational repeat clients? And how have their asks changed throughout mm -hmm. the years? Uh, Interestingly enough, everyone seems to not want to do the same thing. Mm -hmm. They want a change. Mm -hmm. They want to do something that they haven't done before. And that's, that's pretty fun yeah, that's when you can just experiment with and show them things that they didn't ever really think about wanting. That, that can be a lot of fun. And I do have some clients that are on the adventurous side and they have done, I do a good bit of, of work in North Carolina and mountain houses, and so they want to do something that doesn't feel like the city mm -hmm. or at the, at the beach. They don't want to do, very few people want to do the same vibe. Mm -hmm. they, they're, they're looking for a change, and that, I think, is healthy. You know, I'm, I'm always a little discouraged when someone says, well, we'll just take all the furniture out of this room and take it to the beach. Huh? I mean, <laughs> you know, it's dark English mahogany. <laughs> we, we, we're not going to do that, I don't think. It's not going to. So most of, I think most of the people that I work with do want to do something they've never done before. And Absolutely. that's a lot of fun. And that just moves along with the trends of the decades as, as we've mm -hmm. talked about, you know, that they are hopefully are not asking for any more pits and things like that these days. But I guess mm -hmm. maybe one will come and surprise you. Who knows? Who knows? <laughs> <laughs> Devin, do you have any generational clients or repeat clients that have had different asks as the years have gone on? Yes, one comes to mind. And he is a basketball player. Right now we're working on his fourth house together. Wow. So it's always about need. Obviously, we're here because we all like beautiful things. But first comes first is how are we using this house and how is it going to be functional for us? And I think that that's something that can never be lost, right? There are some things where it has to be function over form. And so when the first house, uh, or actually it was um, an apartment, um, when he first was drafted, and his needs were totally different. He didn't know how to drive, because he's from New York. Um, it was a two-bedroom condo. He's never lived on his own, you know? <laughs> and so it was, so this is what a grown-up would do, kind of a thing, <laughs> right? So what, do, why do I need a table lamp? Because all your light can't come from above, my dude, you know? So it's just <laughs> things like that that you have to also show people, right? And then after that, it was like, okay, now I want more space, I want a house. And that house was a lot of just redecorating. And then it was a house where it was like, I love everything that this has. And then it, it forces you to, you know, now I'm like, if you need a putting green, I'm your girl. If you need to redo, a, you know, change a clay tennis court into a, um, into a sport court, I'm your girl. And along the way, as you grow with your clients and they ask for these things, you're like, sure. And then we all go behind the scenes and we figure it out, right? Exactly. We can, <laughs> that sounds great, you know? And so <laughs> I would say that that's, you know, and then as they are also growing with you and see the things that they need and they don't need and what they put value on, I would say you're right. You, they, you, don't, you never want to repeat anything, but then they're like, I need more closet space. Are you willing to give up a bedroom for that? Yes. You know, and before it was everyone's going to be at my house and then that changes. You know, the way you entertain changes as your needs change. You know, he, um, you know, are they in a relationship? Are they married? Do they have children? Are they moving here, you know, for what, you know, for because they like the schools and like they're making some kind of sacrifice somewhere else. So I would say that that is the thing for the repeat client is, you know, you're growing up with them. You know, you're, you know, yeah. you're, 
your bandwidth of what I can say yes to has grown with them and yeah. with their needs. So, you know, you end up with a, you know, you start at a two bedroom condo, you know, on the 12th floor and you have to rent the elevator to, you know, for the certain amount of time. And I didn't know that until I had to do that. <laughs> um, and then, you know, you end up in a 14,000 square foot house in Boston once you straight yeah. it. And those needs change again. Right, so that's, that's part designer, part life coach. This is right? true. Well, your point kind of has this popping up into my head just now that you do have to grow with your clients, and I'm sure lots of them have plenty of asks and such, and some of them maybe you've never done before until you do yeah. it. So, <laughs> have you ever had any kind of crazy asks that you, make you sit there and think like, I don't know how I'm going to pull this off? My project manager's laughing right now. <laughs> Um, for me, the ask was, um, it was a musician, and it was a mountain house, and he was like, I was online, and I saw this taxidermy bear, and I was like, I'm sorry, what? <laughs> <laughs> and so, <laughs> my project manager had to figure out how to get a 10-foot Kodiak cat taxidermy bear from Wisconsin to Park City. She did it. She's been with me now for six years. I'm like, okay, can't oh go anywhere. Um, but that was like, you, you, they have those asks, and you have to figure it out. It Absolutely. ended up in a music video, so it was great. The bear's still there. <laughs> but, you know, but that's, but that's some of the little asks that ends up taking hours out of your day yep. because we are yes people. Sure. Why not? Let's, that sounds great. If you like it, I love it kind of a thing. Do you have anything that you've had clients ask that, or you're just like, I don't know you about don't this. You don't ever say, I don't, I don't know. know. Exactly. <laughs> it's a good point. You say, let me get back to you. <laughs> let me let me think about that. Let's sleep on that. But I, I, I just don't no. think it's ever a good idea to say, I just don't know how to do that. Absolutely. Figure because no matter how much you, you research and study, they'll always doubt you. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Lauren, have you had any crazy ass? We were tasked with um, taking um, a TV on a lift and hiding it inside a bed. So at the very foot of the bed, it was a four-poster with um, oh, wow. draped corners. <coughs> we did a lot of engineering, and I'm not an engineer, but we figured out how to, we upholstered a box that was like the same color as the bedding and everything, and it's very slim, and it sits right inside the bed frame, and it's beautiful. It's amazing. And then when it's down, you wouldn't know it. We cover it with the with the duvet and you would never know it's there, but it took a lot of time and a mock-up yep. and all the stuff. And now I know who to ask if someone asks. <laughs> yeah. right. Can yeah. I have the specs really for fun. that, please? TV right down there at your feet, yeah. Absolutely, so designer, life coach, and magician. Yes. That's and don't forget like. marriage counselor. Yeah. Marriage oh, yeah. counselor, yeah. for sure. Yeah. Psychologist, all of the above. Personal stylist, I feel like that. Yes. Definitely. <laughs> yeah. Therapist, all of it. <laughs> all right, now I'd love to talk a little bit more about your own personal memorable projects that you've worked on in the past. So can you tell us a little bit about what your favorite project was 10, 20, 30 plus years ago, what the key elements of it were and what stood out to you it, compared to maybe what your favorite project in more recent years has been and what is similar between the two? What's different? You know, what, what excited you then versus now? Carol, Lauren, do you want to Rick start? Spitzmiller and I, who's in the audience, <laughs> worked on the most interesting project that I will ever have because right before it was finished, it burned. And it was a historic house in Buckhead. And we were there that afternoon. I swear to you, we had nothing to do with the fire. <laughs> but I've wondered sometimes about just luck because it was a good fire. That old house burned and Rick and Bob were able to go in. They had archived every single detail in the house. They could reproduce all of the historical elements. We redid the electrical. We redid the plumbing. We redid everything and had, I mean, we had, when it burned, and they were getting ready to move in. We had not put furniture in yet. And they looked at us and said, okay, we're going to do one of two things. We're going to sell the property and this is over on, on Blackland, and they could, I mean, it was a lot of acres, and we're going to sell, or we will give you one year to rebuild. And Rick and I looked at each other, 
And we, I mean, we linked arms and we said, okay, we will do it. And that is exactly what we did. We worked on very little else for a year. And it, it just grew exponentially. We went from just a remodel to a completely different ball game. I learned more on, on that project than I have ever learned. I still help them with houses. And as a matter of fact, presently, we are redoing a lot of the rooms. Here we are, what, 20, 25 years later. And we are redecorating a lot of the rooms. Uh, fortunately, Rick's architecture has, has stood up the test of time. <laughs> None of that had to be redone. but. It is fun to go into a project that you started so long ago and see that it's sort of hung together, mm -hmm. that it still feels good, they're still happy, and still like you enough to let you redo it. I mean, that's the, that's the most important thing. It's, um, no, I'll never have another project like that. I remember us standing in the driveway at two o'clock in the morning in that house. It looked like Atlanta was burning because the house looks like Tara sitting up in the hill. <laughs> and we stood there and just looked at each other with our mouths open because we could not believe that this had happened. And um, as I said, it turned out to be the best thing that could have ever happened to that house. They got something that, that felt brand new but still looked vintage. Now, if this is the house on Blackland, you said, is this the same one that's in our presentation? Yeah, or? there are a couple of rooms in So there. if you want to keep an eye on that, it will be the first slide, I believe, after the opening slide with the three um, headshots on them. It's the house that you're referring to. I'm assuming that's probably yeah. Yeah. after it was redone. Oh, or? nothing. So, I mean, it was mm -hmm. totally, it was totally yeah. redone. Yeah. Totally. Redone. Absolutely. So and keep an eye out. we had a great time going to... Um, France and buying furniture um, that she still has. And, um, you know, she, I think, the clients grew from that experience because they realized, well, wait a minute, we can start all over again. We don't have to do what we were doing before. We can make this room bigger. We can do. So it, it just turned out to be, I think, a great experience. For, for all of us. Absolutely. Oh, so cool. Lauren, what about you? How has, um, yes. <laughs> <laughs> I was saying, can you tell us a I little so bit into that? Story. <laughs> so, that sounds can good. Can you tell us a little bit about your favorite project, maybe 10, 20 plus years ago or so, and what stood out to you? What, what excited you then compared oh, to your most recent favorite projects? So probably it was the first one that I ever had published and it was, um, I didn't have any help. I think I slept every, side table, I hung every plate on the wall myself. Um, you know, like I took every every little detail, I think I drove over there myself, but for like the, the big stuff. And I had worked with this client, um, it was a Stan Dixon project, and I had worked with a, the client through the construction. And I was just so excited to be given this whole house. It was the first time I was able to do the whole thing. And um, it was just super exciting, and they were really, um, really nice and let me kind of do whatever I wanted. And the, the end goal was the client's 40th birthday. And so I was racing, racing, racing. And my final piece was this taxidermied fox that was standing so it's a on taxidermy. A, <laughs> <laughs> and I was out and I was like, this is so random, but this is going to be perfect right here in the window. And I remember walking that dang fox in and <laughs> setting it down. And I swear it was like the party started in 10 minutes and there was the fox. Oh, and, but it was just, yeah, it was yeah. just a really rewarding experience to be able to pick literally everything in that house and then to actually physically bring it in and, and do it myself. Absolutely. Um, that was really fun. Okay. So, but I have a new, but my new favorite one. Let's know, hear one it. Too, which is also is more recent, re involves Rick Spitzmiller over there too. <laughs> Rick, you're a uh, I know, isn't he? <laughs> um, but no, because I, that, they're, I grew up kind of watching all the things that they had been doing and all the wonderful projects that people had been doing with them. And um, we got to work together on a really beautiful house in uh, Greenville that we just completed. And um, working, with, working with architects that really listen to designers is a really wonderful, um, it's, a, it's a great yeah, relationship. It really and, it's, um, and it's rewarding for both sides because they really listen and I think we really listen back and try to honor the architecture with what we've, 
what we're putting in there. And um, anyway, that's my that's my now Love project. It. Perfect, yeah. Devin. What comes to mind? I can't for you? wait your, to hear this. Your favorite <laughs> project before <laughs> your favorite Come project on. now. Tell us. <laughs> Tell us. Well, for me, it's the my role has changed. I haven't always been an interior designer. You know, I worked at Robert Quo on Melrose across from the Pacific yes. Design Center for five years before I moved to Atlanta 15 years ago. So my function in this in this business hasn't always been this. Um, so, you know, I, I think I learned how it's a really, we have a weird job. You know, it's like, you, it's not only just being creative, but then you have to go shopping with clients. You have to source things, you have to, you know, and so with me working at Robert Quo, I learned, you know, I'm seeing Kelly Wurstler was a client that I had all the time, Holly Hunt coming in all the time. And that's a big deal when you're young and you're like, oh my God, it's Holly Hunt, you know? And it's like, it's, it's exciting, you know? And you see the way that they work with their clients was the way that I learned how to do that with my clients. And you learn how to do a PO and you learn, you know, why it's important to spec everything to a T, you know, all of those things are so important. And now I have taken that attitude into my business where you leave as little up that could happen as possible because as somebody who's worked in a showroom, I know what it looks like on that end. So for me, it's just like my role 10, 15, or now 20 years ago, and 15 years ago, it is absolutely not the same as being a principal designer now. Definitely. And probably the most exciting. And then, you know, again, with the diversity of people that are coming in for different things. I mean, a lot of people, you know, would use Robert Quo for garden and or it's lighting specific and also antiques. But, you know, the most recent pro uh, project that I've done, but I kind of have always been that person of like, let's see how much we can diversify things is doing a 13 home neighborhood in Smyrna. Wow. So wow. we just big closed task. on the last house mm -hmm. probably about eight months ago, but that was five years of my life. Oh my goodness. You know, so it was an opportunity for everybody. You know, you want to have the cohesiveness of you want to go into a neighborhood and it all makes sense, but everybody got to the point of wanting a custom home because they weren't finding what they were looking for. So you want to give them that custom experience and making sure that they get everything that they want, yeah. but also it's a neighborhood, right? And so that has to have that cohesiveness. So that same idea of every client is you want it to be personal and some people are a lot more traditional than their neighbor directly across the street. Mm -hmm. And that is, I, is probably con consecutively the most diverse thing that I've done Absolutely. because 13 homes in five years is a lot. That is, <laughs> yeah, I have a headache already. Yeah. All right, it was well, fun. Let's we, do it again. I think we only have a few minutes left, so does anyone have any audience questions that they would like to ask our panelists? Katie has a mic back there. Anyone, anyone? Don't be scared. We have one right here, and then Meg, I think, has one up here, too. Hi, uh, this is just for any of the panelists. I wanted to know um, for, um, the comment that was made by Madam Weeks uh, when we talked about um, people for coming out of Atlanta and how that is kind of changing up the design um, industry and the creativity, um, you know, how this is a good thing, makes designers grow, you have to study more, you have to learn more. But have there been any conversations or any type of fear that some designers may have that them coming in may end up causing to even to lose certain authenticity of design that is authentically Atlantan or authentically Southern, while you have this pro, um, th there's also this con. So has there been any conversations among your colleagues or members about the con? Any concerns about that? So the question is, um, while you were saying about transplants and things like that and how it's a good thing to come into the city and it pushes you to grow, um, it also raises the question of authenticity and does that cause you to perhaps question your authenticity of your design style by trying to push that status quo. And so she's asking, I think, if you've had any conversations with colleagues or other designers about um, staying true to yourself even though you are, are trying to work a, with these That's others. an interesting question yeah. because that is an interesting question.
because I think there is, for a designer, there is always going to be that, well, not all, but often there is a squeamish feeling that you get when someone wants to do something that is not right. Mm -hmm. And how do I, and perhaps it's because they aren't from around here and they don't realize that it's not going to work environmentally, it's not gonna work with the climate, it's not gonna just work, period, for whatever reason. And, and it, it's taken, I think, all of us back to the, our degrees in psychiatry. <laughs> <laughs> it, it takes a lot of forethought how to tell someone that is a terrible idea. And you just don't understand what why it won't work. So it's a real, it's a real art yeah. to be able to say no without hurting someone's feelings and questioning their, their judgment and their, their taste. But yes, I mean, that, that is often, I think, do you give in? Do you go ahead and do that even though you know it's not right? Well, no, because as you're... No, you can't, and you just have to figure out how to circumvent and, and jump over those hurdles. And, mm -hmm. and I think that's part of our job that really can be the most uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Yeah. Can I jump in on that yes, at all? Yes, of course. For me, I think that it's always about fit. I think that yeah. it is, there are so many different talented, talented, amazing interior designers, architects, and designers, especially here in Atlanta. So if you have a client where you were like, well, that's one way to do it, and you really just don't, you're not seeing eye to eye on something that's major. I mean, there's always like a push-pull yeah. and you can give, you know, like, I'll give you that one because this one's more important or, or, it's, or it's your bathroom. It's you spend your money how you'd like. But you, we also have to go back to there's a reason why you hired us. And I can see what this is going to look like in the end. And I understand what you are looking for. And there's a trust factor there. So sometimes if people have a lot of pushback, I'm like, you know, and that hasn't happened to me often, but it's always because we'll get to a point in a project. I can think of one specific time in the last maybe like five or six years where we just got to a point where if we were doing some revisions and I'm like, you know, I think that we have gotten this to where we can and it's not a bad thing all the time. Sometimes it's just about fit. You like the way that I spec a home. You like, you like my bathrooms and you like my kitchens, but maybe you don't like how I pull together your decorative accessories and your furniture. And that's also okay. So I would say that that's another thing. You, it's always about fit. And I think that that's a good thing of where an Instagram and a Pinterest come in because you can really see somebody, not just the end result of what we do, but you know, if you're looking at our stories and things like that, you can see how a room develops and grows and how a kitchen really came together and not just the finished product in Lawrence Magazine. Definitely. Meg, did you have a question you wanted to ask? This is so interesting, and I'm just, I'm literally hanging on every word that you all are saying. Um, but this is a question about technology, and, and there's so much technology in homes now. Does it ever backfire? For example, my pet peeve are the Lutron lighting systems, mm -hmm. and you literally just want to turn the light out. But I can't figure out how to turn the light out, especially if I'm at a hotel or mm -hmm. in a house that I'm not familiar with. Is there a backlash to people saying maybe instead of like, you know, a plastic switch, maybe we're doing those lovely little old fashioned switches that are so elegant and cheap, yes. but it's not this panel where I have to literally put my glasses on to, <laughs> to read the bathroom. Is this <laughs> the hallway? Let me try that. So yeah. are you having technology backlash? We just had this conversation with a client, I think like two weeks ago, and she has very tall ceilings and, and very tall windows. And she will not automate her drapery. Yeah, and she's, she's like, I have arms and legs. I'm doing it. I don't care. I'm doing it because I'm not going to deal with going to find the remote or get my phone. I'm just going to draw my own drapery. And How I long has it, she been doing that? Well, <laughs> <laughs> not long yet. Not at all yet. So we'll just find out what happens. We'll check back yeah, next year. That's, that's what we're like, are you sure? Because we really feel like you should. But no, she's, oh. no I have arms oh, and legs. I'm funny. doing it. That's a yeah. challenge. Wow. <laughs> now that's a challenge. Stay tuned. Yeah. 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 <laughs> but those little, it is, it is hard, and to see the little, either the engraving or the, the yeah. whatever the labels are on those yeah. little lighting panels. Yeah. Yeah. 
-huh. It always happens on uh, Super Bowl Sunday, every single time. <laughs> um, for me, I think that it's really important to have reps and partners with when it comes to things like that. Yeah. You know, I know what the goal is at the end. We want you to be able to turn your lights on and off because I know exactly what you mean. Um, but it's making sure that you have found your AV company that you can text at nine o'clock at night, that they can remotely reboot the system right. and all of those things. These are the things, again, when we're talking about, we aren't just picking out fabrics over here. We have to think about things sometimes backwards. And so that's something that is really important that whoever you are having install all of these things that you really truly do feel like they are your partner and a part of your team when you're doing this because you know what the worst thing for any of our clients or when something doesn't work. It's nobody likes it. It's just like you walk by it and you're like, I don't even know why I paid for that. And so, you know, that's the thing that we don't want to have happen. So I would say that having those conversations of saying, well, here are three different options. Maybe you want all of your, your main floor to be this and then all of your secondary bedrooms and or just your primary can be that because you can mix the two. So I, that's what I think. I think that before you go off the deep end with the technology, make sure that you're with somebody from <coughs> beginning to end can facilitate all of those things so that on Super Bowl Sunday when the sound outside doesn't work and they're ready to burn their house down, um, that you have someone to call because you know what I can't do is help you with that. <laughs> one last question here. Yes, um, as Atlanta continues to change, we talked about migration and different people moving to different parts of the country. In town, we're starting to see multi-generational living as well as where you have brownstones, you have multiple units in one structure. What are you guys seeing in terms of trends coming post-COVID that addresses or speaks to multi-generational and multi-units within one structure from a design standpoint? I got all these blank stares. From all no, I, you're like, no, I think everyone's sick of me talking. I'm, so I'm, I'm just seeing a horror show. <laughs> 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 I mean, truly, just... <laughs> Ah. You're gonna live with me? Yeah. <laughs> Go away. <laughs> Are you guys seeing any trends moving forward then on, on these multi generational living structures or? Well, Devin, if we're going to talk mind. about going back to what is, you know, a, a very traditional Southern thing is carriage houses. I mm -hmm, think that yeah. that has made a big, like, pe people like the idea of having a pool house and then also having um, an in-law suite or whatever you would like to call it. I mm -hmm. think that that's something as well. But then also when you're talking about floor plans and having two masters on main on opposite sides and then also being thoughtful about if it is going to be, because we don't want to put our in-laws in the basement, they're in the terrace level, right? <laughs> yes. And then, <laughs> and then just being mindful about be people being able to come and go as they please. So that's absolutely something that has been happening. For me, I think when you're talking about trends with that is you're seeing a lot more modern design. Um, roof lines are changing in Atlanta. I mean, if mm -hmm. you guys drive away from here, it is like they're flat. <laughs> you know, all of the for sale signs are like the coming soon. It's definitely, it's, I, I think that that is one thing. And then also being mindful that everyone I found is going smaller. You know, if we're getting away from that McMansion thing, that is all about the technology, it's higher end products in a smaller space. Mm -hmm. We have so many people who really think that if you just close the vent in those three bedrooms upstairs that you're saving electricity, it's not a thing. <laughs> you know, and so I would say that that is something that people are okay with. I'll have a smaller house, let's, you know, do the multi-generational thing in the back, we'll have a pool separating us. And that, you know, so you're essentially maybe cutting the square footage in half, but then splitting it up. Mm -hmm. I would say that that's something that I've seen. Definitely. All right, I think we're good. Yeah, I think that's Any perfect. Any questions? That's perfect ending.